Okay. All right, we're going to get started. Um, thank you, everyone. First of all, this is a lovely turnout um, for, I think, this very important topic. My name is Dr. Lisa Sombrato. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm the vice chair for the Department of Psychiatry uh, for Clinical Services here at Weill Cornell on East 68th Street. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian. I also want to welcome and thank Senator Liz Kruger for co-sponsoring this event tonight. Um, Senator Kruger, we want to thank you for your continued interest and advocacy on behalf of mental health. Um, Senator Kruger serves on the Mental Health Committee in the Senate um, and supports uh, access to quality care for all. And specifically, she sponsored Senate Bill S4000, which would improve treatment options for women diagnosed with maternal depression, um, a bill as of June 20th that's passed both the uh, Senate and the Assembly. And I'm sure that's just one of many ways you've impacted uh, people of New York State accessing care. Um, I just want to spend a few, take a little time to spend a few words on uh, talking about this topic, um, mental wellness and, and, and mental health and aging. From the point of view of a psychiatrist, I'm glad to see this title because I'm glad to see that we're starting from the perspective of preventative care and wellness, how to stay healthy. Um, we talk about healthy cardiac lifestyle and you know um, healthy bone health, you know, do things to prevent. And it's about time, I think we really emphasize that in mental health, that there are things that can be done um, in a preventative way. But it's also important to realize and recognize when people need help that early intervention, early recognition and intervention, and access to help is very important. Um, and I work as an ER psychiatrist, so from um, my point of view, I often see failures of access to health and when things get um, down the road and down the line and people end up in emergency room, as an ER psychiatrist, I like to say, I hope we see our business dwindle um, through both um, prevention and early, early recognition. As many of you know, um, there's been a lot of initiatives in New York, New York Thrive, uh, to raise recognition, decrease stigma, and, um, and increase access uh, to, um, to care. So thank you for joining us. We're going to hear from three experts in this field that Senator Kruger is going to introduce. So Senator Kruger. Evening again. Welcome. I you know, this room's really filled up. This is great. I, as again, as I said before, my name's Liz Kruger. I'm a state senator representing what I euphemistically call Bed Pen Alley, um, <laughs> right here, and the east side of Manhattan from around 96th Street down to around 10th Street, and we zig and zag, and if you live in my district, welcome, and if you don't live in my district, equally welcome, and the way you know if I'm your representative is if I come in your mailbox occasionally with little pictures in the corner. That's how I tell people that's how you know your electeds, who your electeds are. But I'm very glad to be here. I want to thank New York Presbyterian and Weill Cornell uh, Medicine for hosting this event in this fabulous facility. Um, I also want to thank the co-sponsors that we worked with, Carter Bird Network, Geriatric Mental Health Alliance of New York, Grow New York City, Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, Manhattan Community Board 8, the New York City Department for the Aging, and Search and Care. I also want to recognize, right as we begin, and thank Wendy Brennan from my office, who's up in the back and you can't see her, but you should get to know her. Wendy is working on senior issues and mental health issues for my office, and she is a expert herself with a long career in this field, and we are delighted that we have grabbed her up in my district office to be helpful to people. And she is a passionate advocate for these issues. Um, I want to let people know that we will have a question and answer period at the end. And what we find works really well is if you write your questions down on index cards that you can receive from my staff. If you want one now and you didn't get one, raise your hand. And people will come down each row and see if you need one. 
If you realize during the presentations, oh, now I want one, no problem, raise your hand then, somebody will hand you one, and then we will go through and try to get to as many questions as possible. The reason I have found this works so well is rather than trying to get a lot of different people to microphones, which takes up time, you actually, I get to take a look and go, oh look, four people have the exact same question because it's so important, and so you just read off the question once. Um, so just make sure that if you have any questions, you want, you're set up and have an opportunity uh, to give us the cards during the event. We're going to have three fabulous speakers tonight, and what I'm going to do, just because I don't like to interview, the, interrupt the flow so much, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them right now, but then they will come up separately um, to give their presentations. But our first speaker was, will be Dr. Mark Lax, who is the Director of Geriatrics for the New York Presbyterian Health System. He's also Co-Chief of the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Gerontology at Weill Medical College of Cornell, a tenured professor of medicine at the college, a graduate of U of Pennsylvania, so did my husband, um, and NYU School of Medicine completed a residency in internal medicine at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, board certified internal medicine and geriatric medicine. His major areas of focus are the disenfranchisement of the elderly, and he has published widely in the areas of elder abuse and neglect, financial exploitation, do you want to come work at my office? These issues come up every day. The measurement of functional status and the financing of health care for the aging population. He also sits on the board of the American Federation of Aging Research, where he currently serves as president. A real underachiever, don't you think? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> After Dr. Lax, um, we will uh, bring up Dr. Joanne Siri. And Dr. Siri is a professor at the Department of Psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medicine and an attending at New York Presbyterian. She directs community integration for the Institute of Geriatric Psychology, Psychiatry to build and sustain partnerships to foster research collaborations, improve the delivery of mental health care to older adults. She is known in the field for her research on the impact of stigma on accessing mental, mental health treatment. And we know what a huge issue that is and how important it is to get through stigma so you can actually get the help that will improve your lives and the lives of those you love. Dr. Siri has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals and is a recipient of numerous awards. In addition to her research, she chairs West Chester County Geriatric Mental Health Collaborative serves on the board of directors of the Mental Health Foundation, the advisory board of the Geriatric Mental Health Alliance, and is a reviewer of the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices for SAMHSA, you can ask her later what that stands for, and the National Institute of Health, another underachiever with us tonight. Finally, not last, but not last but not least, we will hear from Dr. Stacy Torres, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and associate at the Center for Social and Demographic Analysis at the University of Albany. She earned her PhD in sociology from New York University, holds a BA in comparative literature from Fordham University, and an MFA in nonfiction creative writing from Columbia University, a Renaissance woman. Dr. Torres' dissertation in urban ethnography of older adults living in a gentrified New York City neighborhood is under contract with the University of California Press. Her research has been supported by fellowships from Ford Foundation, American Sociological Association. Her articles, essays, and op-eds have appeared in numerous outlets, including the New York Times. I was just reading her op-ed earlier today. She's a proud first-generation college graduate born and raised in New York City, a third underachiever with us tonight. So I am just delighted to have these three experts who are all open to participating tonight. We are all going to learn from them. And again, remember, questions on the index cards. We'll collect them up as we move through the evening. And now we get to the good part. Uh, Dr. Mark Lax.
Welcome to Bedpan Alley, everyone. Uh, I would gladly work for you as opposed to, that could be a big upgrade for me. <laughs> so um, my name is Mark Lax. I direct uh, geriatrics here at New York Presbyterian, and I'm a professor of uh, internal medicine and geriatrics. I'm an interesting choice as the first presenter because I'm not a mental health professional by training. I'm an internist. I, I take care of diabetes and hypertension and uh, arthritis uh, in a primary care setting. Uh, and so you might reasonably ask, why is this guy going first to talk about uh, mental health needs of older people? And there are several reasons. And the first and foremost is, is that um, in my practice, uh, there are diseases that produce suffering, but I would argue that mental health problems uh, produce human suffering of the highest order, uh, uh, often more compelling than the diseases that I just mentioned. And, and so, so that's why I'm so glad to be here to speak about this. And I do see it, as Lisa pointed out, as a primary care issue, as a preventative issue. We're sending people for colonoscopy and mammography, and uh, uh, mental health is very high on my agenda as, a, as a, something that robs quality of life from older people and the people who care about them and love them. So, so that's number one. Number two has to do with Joanne's work about stigma. Okay, so mental health disorders are very stigmatizing, and for my oldest patients, uh, they will not see a mental health professional, many of them, so I am it. Um, I'm not a psychiatrist, uh, although I've been accused of being one, and it's a badge I wear proudly, and so it's often primary care providers who are hopefully recognizing depression, anxiety, and many of these other disorders. Sadly, the data would suggest often they are not. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and so it's critical that we effectively train um, uh, uh, physicians at all levels to recognize this. Um, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time trying to get these uh, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed young medical students interested in aging and geriatrics. And I tell them that unless they're going to be pediatricians, they essentially will be practicing geriatric medicine no matter what their specialty or their subspecialty. So, so that's the other reason. Uh, some other reasons I'm interested in this particular topic, well, uh, quite candidly, I believe in my heart that Medicare has abdicated its mental health responsibilities to older people. Uh, mental health coverage, while it's improved under, uh, under uh, many of the more recent legislations that was recently under threat, um, uh, I still think uh, mental health is woefully underfunded. And if you look at the literature on mental health and various other chronic illnesses, um, the presence of mental health, for example, mental health disorders like depression in the setting of other medical illness just is multiplicative in terms of what it does to, to cost, to suffering, to length of stay in a hospitalization. Um, and then lastly, uh, and I'm not proud to say this, is that uh, when you look at the data on how physicians do with respect to recognizing and appropriately treating mental health uh, problems in older adults, the rank and file aren't so great. Um, they miss uh, depression, anxiety, cognitive impairment in many, many cases. These studies have been going on for 20 or 30 years where uh, a patient comes to the physician's office, a physician with whom they might have a long-standing primary care relationship and waiting outside the door is, uh, is a research assistant formally testing for things like depression. And uh, we're just not good enough at it. There are many reasons for that. Uh, uh, the face of mental health disorders in older people often is different than in younger people. So for example, in older adults, it's very common to have depression without sadness. Depression can present as irritability. It can present as, as, um, as, uh, as, as a somatic complaint, a bodily complaint. And so medical students who were trained 20 or 30 years ago to look for lack of appetite, lack of energy, will miss it. And again, I spend a fair amount of my time effectively trying to convince uh, older uh, uh, medical students, you know, not to become dermatologists and cardiologists and plastic surgeons and to do what I do. And we've been reasonably successful. So let me talk about uh, the sort of two or three major things that I see as compelling uh, mental health issues in older adults. Um, uh, they, I think, are primarily depression, um, anxiety, and uh, various forms of cognitive impairment like Alzheimer's disease uh, and other forms of dementia. Um, I already spoke a little bit about uh, depressive syndromes. Um, you know, uh, the thing about this is, is that there are highly effective treatments for depression. 
uh, and, and uh, other mental health problems, and they're more effective than the treatments we have for medical illnesses, and we carefully diagnose those. And so it just, it just I find it so um, maddening uh, when people suffer needlessly uh, because they haven't been diagnosed. And there's also, also some literature to suggest that when physicians do properly diagnose depression in older adults, they don't perhaps manage the medications properly. They start too high on the medications. They don't use uh, supportive psychotherapy, a whole bunch of literature on this, which uh, many of my colleagues here in research at uh, Wild Cornell Medicine are trying to address. Often overlooked uh, in the care of older adults um, is anxiety. Um, uh, anxiety uh, really is uh, uh, just robs quality of life from, from people of all ages. Uh, and again, effective treatments. Uh, sitting in the back of the audience is one of my faculty members who's a world expert in this, uh, Kelly Trevino, who does cognitive behavioral therapy, non-medication therapy for anxiety disorders. Um, and I just think that uh, we really need to spend more time thinking about some things other than depression and dementia in older adults and effectively think about anxiety disorders. Um, uh, there, are, there are reasons to be anxious as we age. Um, you know, look, I'm, 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 geriatricians tend to be glass half full people, but uh, I'm mindful that aging has serious challenges, uh, bereavement, isolation, uh, loss of friends and loved ones. But uh, there are treatments for these maladies. And finally, um, I won't spend too much time talking about uh, uh, dementias like Alzheimer's disease, other than to talk about them from the vantage of caregivers, because this has become a big focus of uh, the work in my division and geriatricians throughout the country, which is this emerging concept of what we call caregiver burden. And if you've had to be a caregiver for someone with chronic illness like Alzheimer's disease, or another neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's disease, um, uh, it can rob the caregiver of mental health. There's a large literature on how it can produce medical illness uh, in, in caregivers, and we must recognize the role that caregivers play uh, in supporting our healthcare system. There's literally billions of dollars in uncompensated care uh, that have uh, been provided by caregivers that supports our economy. Uh, in the last presidential administration, there were attempts to recognize uh, that contribution with uh, perhaps uh, financial support. Um, I'd also point out that caregiving is a sexist undertaking. It is done primarily by women. I see heads shaking up and down. And uh, if there are 20 brothers and one sister and mom gets sick, guess who winds up providing the care, okay? And that often affords loss of income. It affords loss of, uh, of, of job opportunities. So caregiving will become a larger and larger issue uh, as we effectively uh, become a more uh, a aging population. The last thing I'd like to talk about doesn't really um, have, a, kind of have a medical diagnosis like in DSM-10 or whatever diagnostic coding schemes we talk about. But I'd like to say a few words about Loneliness, because uh, of all the things I see in my practice, uh, I see um, I see loneliness as just a, just a, a tremendously eroding factor in the quality of life of older people. Not only uh, does it lead to depression and other mental health problems, um, it can also exacerbate existing health problems. Uh, and we live in a city that is so large and so interconnected. Um, this morning I was at a, a magnificent presentation by one of the physicians here who runs something called the LEAP program. It's a program in which uh, medical students for their four years of medical school are connected with patients, and uh, we do this in our division with older patients, in which they come to them with appointments, uh, check in on them on a monthly basis, and it's been life-changing for both the students uh, and, uh, and, in fact, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for the patients as well. Uh, and uh, many of these kids are deposited here for the first time from you know, rural Kansas, and they could use a grandparent or two. Uh, and it's been remarkable. I heard a touching story today about uh, uh, such a pairing in which uh, the patient in the, in the um, student's third or fourth year of medical school um, became gravely ill, ultimately um, uh, died of a, a cancer uh, at Memorial across the street, and the medical student actually eulogized the patient. Um, uh, they became so close. Uh, I was told that the, I think the patient was a teacher and, and walked the student in a 
through the illness in a loving way that was compelling. So um, I believe that mental health problems uh, deserve equal time or better time than the medical diseases I treat and that I was trained to treat. Um, you're going to hear from, from some other great panelists here, but uh, looking forward to the, to, the, to the questions and the panel. And uh, without any further ado, Dr. Syrie. Thank you, Dr. Lax. Uh, now comes the technology part. Let's see. Ah, great. Okay. So, um, no, Dr. Lax did not write my slides, but you will hear some things more than once with numbers attached to them. So I apologize for the redundancy. Um, and I really want to thank everybody also for turning out, for Senator Kruger for inviting us, and for the sponsors. This is a wonderful thing. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about mental health needs in later life with some data. I'm going to talk to you about the barriers to detecting mental health um, and some new models. And that'll be kind of the new information that Dr. Lax didn't mention so far. Um, we know worldwide that about 15% of adults over the age of 60 suffer from mental disorders. In the US, it's somewhere about 15 to 20%. Um, the largest numbers are in uh, dementia and depression, um, as Dr. Delox mentioned. Um, we have a tendency to see mostly people, as you've just said, um, who appear with loneliness, depression, and anxiety. That's what we tend to see the most when people present for services. Um, and the other thing is that we have to remember that the numbers are going to grow as our population ages. The proportions, even if they do not change, are just going to mean more individuals to serve, which is why I think this is so important to focus on how we're serving this population. Um, and of course, there are uh, very, you know, a lot of challenges to aging and um, a lot of diversity in what we see. Um, you know, it's, it's an exciting time to be doing mental health in New York City. Um, we have an initiative in place by the mayor that I would never have been able to believe would have existed five years ago. Um, it's something like 54 initiatives and $850 million targeting mental health. Um, I would have thought that somebody was crazy if they had told me that that was the truth. Um, and some data from them, which I kind of like, including the fact that one in five New Yorkers experiences mental disorder, and it would take 18 Yankee stadiums, and there still wouldn't be enough room to wrestle with, um, to put every New Yorker wrestling with diagnosed depression. So I, I like this image. It's, it's quite prevalent. Um, we know some, from some more local work, um, we know from the Mental Health Association in New York City, Lisa's here, Lisa First is here, and uh, New York City Department for the Aging, that it's closer to one in 10 New Yorkers who are community dwelling who suffer from clinically significant depression. And we'll. Oh, sure. Yeah, and if you can't hear, hear me, just wave. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, we also know that the rates of need are higher amongst people with mobility limitations um, who are having a harder time getting out. Is that better? Yes? Yes? No? OK. Um, and we also know that those older adults living in areas impacted by Superstorm Sandy also had higher rates of mental health. Um, the other thing that we know is, is that once you bring older adults into treatment or you help them support treatment, they often drop out or are not adherent. So you, know, you can see across the board a challenge that I think we face. Um, this slide kind of answers the question of, are the rates of depression higher in older adults than they are in younger adults, or are they the same? And the answer to the question is, it depends on where you go and who you ask. So if you go to settings um, where older adults are facing uh, medical conditions, they're having mobility difficulties, the rates get very high. Uh, the highest rates, actually, we've documented so far uh, with the New York City Department for the Aging are actually victims of elder abuse. But you can see in this slide that as you move to places where there's more medical disability, the rates get higher. So why don't people seek care? Well, there's lots of reasons. Um, the most common 
thing that we face is that people think depression is a normal part of aging. And we'll talk about a number of different mental health conditions, but I'm going to focus on depression um, because it is so prevalent. Um, it doesn't look, as Dr. Lack said, as it's expected to look. It's very hard to self-identify. If you wake up with the flu one morning, you know something's amiss. Depression is more insidious. It comes on slower. It's only in retrospect that people often have a tendency to have realized that they withdrew from their community, that they're not enjoying life the way they used to. Um, so it's less, easy, it's, it's less um, possible for the individual themselves to actually diagnose it. And it leads to very poor outcomes, as was mentioned. The other thing is most people don't know what available services are out there. And again, this makes sense. If you think about it, you really don't know what the services for diabetes are until you get a diabetes diagnosis. And mental health in that way is no different, except for the stigma. But the reality is, is we don't all walk around knowing all the services that are available to us. So there really is a lack of knowledge. Um, the other thing that we've found, and, and uh, Dr. Lax referred to that, is that we're finding more and more people who are getting mental health treatment. They consider themselves in treatment, but they're not fully treated. They're not back to where we would consider the usual self. So they're on an antidepressant, um, most often gotten from their primary care doctor, who's, again, the only place they may accept the treatment from, but they're really not experiencing the kind of remission that we would like to see them get. And most importantly, beliefs about treatment. Oops, there we go. Um, so, you know, how do you find out what people's beliefs are? You ask them. Um, and people are actually remarkably forthcoming about their concerns. Um, most people would prefer, not most people, a significant minority of people would prefer to solve depression by themselves. They worry about the stigma. Older adults have a tendency to worry about stigma related to the people they care about. That's what they worry about, that the people that they love, their communities, their friends, will treat them differently. And that cost is one of the most important barriers to accessing care. Um, you know, uh, many of you are, are, uh, remember the crude mental health services that were available, um, and you know how difficult uh, treatment was in the 50s and the 60s. Our, our treatments are getting better, but I think those you know, leftover images are still there where people got removed from their homes, they got hospitalized, and that was the end of the story. So, so uh, clearly when there is a need, it's really important to have depression detected and seek treatment. Um, we know that older adults prefer psychotherapy over medication, and if you think about it, that's one of the things that's kind of a challenge, because if you're going to primary care looking for assistance, um, unless you're lucky enough to come to the right center over here, um, you're not going to find somebody who's going to be able to offer you an alternative between medication and psychotherapy. You're going to get an antidepressant. And a lot of people don't want to take another medication. Um, the other thing is we know that there are subpopulations of people who don't respond well to antidepressants. It's, it's better than most of the treatments we have, but it's not a panacea. So, um, you know, again, I think it's most important that people seek treatment, but it's also important that they go to get the kind of treatment they're looking for, because that's something else we also know, is that people who prefer a particular type of treatment and get the other are less likely to follow through with the treatment. So if you want medication and you're offered psychotherapy, you're more likely to drop out and vice versa. Okay, so what do we do? Um, we try an, uh, a couple of different strategies to improve the delivery of services, uh, mental health care to older adults. That's my area of expertise, that's my soapbox. Um, the first thing we do is we try and bring mental health services wherever we can find older adults. We bring them out to the community, we bring them to services that serve older adults, because we recognize that the older adult population is not gonna use the community mental health clinic. We know that data. We also try and build better psychotherapies. Uh, psychotherapies that target what we know about the changes in the brain. Psychotherapies that we can teach to community-based therapists so they can effectively deliver a treatment that's evidence-based, that has outcomes that are documented. 
um, and that we can really know whether somebody's improving or not. And if they're not, to be able to refer them to an alternative treatment. We also work on trying to improve the acceptance of mental health treatments. Um, and that's usually in two different ways. One is by trying to improve referrals for services. So I go out to places where older adults may be seen who need services and work with the providers to help them make a referral. That's, it sounds like a simple thing, but it's actually quite complex. Um, so we try and help them refer more effectively and help whoever it is that needs services get there. And also to go to primary care settings so that older adults who are offered medication know um, how to kind of integrate that into their lives, how to be more adherent, how to know what kinds of questions to bring up to doctors and things like that. So they really can participate in the treatment as fully as possible. So I don't know how many people picked up a PHQ-9 on the way out, on the way in earlier, but this is actually the prime tool that's used both in health and mental health to screen for depression, the patient health questionnaire. And I'm sharing it with you for a couple of reasons. One is that I think it really does open some people's eyes in terms of the symptoms that are considered part of depression. So most people do think that depression is um, characterized by tearfulness or sadness. Um, but in fact, if you look at these symptoms, and these are the nine symptoms that would be reviewed, five of which you would need to meet criteria for di depression diagnosis. And so you can talk about things like difficulty concentration, um, difficulty sleeping, feeling hopeless, uh, losing interest in activities they used to love. And by the way, that's an important criterion because it doesn't mean stopping doing things that you used to enjoy doing. It means losing interest so that you still have an interest in either doing or watching or participating, even though you may not be doing it. Um, so this is actually a screening tool. It can be filled out by the individual. It can be administered. Um, Health and Hospital Corporation uses it uh, regularly. You may actually have seen this sitting in a waiting room. Um, and I share this with you because I really feel like one of the important missions today is to really educate people about the symptoms of depression. You don't have to fill it out. You don't have to you know, do anything. Take it with you. Use it as a, um, as a tool so that you know what the symptoms of depression are. Um, a clinically significant uh, score on a PHQ-9 is a score of 10 or above. So when you, and, and in order to have that clinically significant set of symptoms, you have to have either little interest or pleasure. Whoops, my slides are advancing without me. Um, I guess I'm not talking fast enough. Um, little interest or, ple in ple or pleasure in doing things or feeling down or depressed. It's one of those two what we call gateway symptoms. Um, because again, going back to the flu analogy, if you have the flu, you can, rank, you can kind of collect these symptoms pretty quickly without necessarily losing interest um, in the things that you care about. So um, you have a copy, take it with you, um, think about it, um, consider it, and I think it's a really important increased awareness that you have now about how to screen for depression. Um, so, you know, as Mark said earlier, psychotherapy works. Um, it, it really does make a difference. Medications can work too. Um, we know that and from our work that what we try and do is develop novel psychotherapies and compare them to therapies that we know work so that we can kind of keep building a better mousetrap um, because not everything works for everybody. Um, one of the things that I always look for because stigma is such an important part of what I think about is people who publicly come out and speak about depression. And Mike Wallace is one of them. And I just found out as I was doing the research for this presentation that apparently Mike Wallace, William Styron, and Art Buckwald um, considered themselves the Blues Brothers. And they talked about their experience with depression and served as a kind of an informal support group for each other, which I think is really important because it's not just accessing care, but being able to kind of talk to the people around you about your struggle. Um, you know, we used to say, oh, you have to treat it this way. Actually, we, have to, we think we have to treat it always with support, with active treatment. Um, and so I really wanted to share that with you. Okay, 
Last but not least, uh, current projects in the community. I mentioned Thrive NYC. Um, we actually have a program where we're bringing mental health services to um, senior centers in Brooklyn and Staten Island. Um, we have a study um, Mark and I are working on bringing um, depression treatment to elder abuse victims. We have two um, psychotherapy research projects for people who have depression. One is really just testing two different psychotherapies in effect. In the back somewhere is Eve, who's uh, part of my staff, if you want to hear more about that. Um, and we have a study that's looking at depression after stroke, which is very, very common. Um, so we know that successful aging requires good mental health. Uh, somebody once said, there is no health without good mental health. And I think that that's something that Dr. Lax um, reiterated today for us. Um, it's really important to be able to ask for help. And if you know somebody who needs help, say something. I hate to, I'm sorry to capitalize on that kind of terrible saying, but I really do believe it. And it is part of the Thrive NYC initiative is to alert people about the symptoms of depression, about mental health need, so that they can say to somebody they care about, hey, you're not your usual self, you know? There are options out there. Or to look in the mirror and say, you know what, things are not not the way they used to be. And I think that's really the first step. Um, the second thing that's really important is getting quality care, um, because I think there is some inconsistency in what's being delivered. Um, we're, we're lucky to be doing a lot of interesting research and delivering services funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, and we're happy about that. And if you want to hear more about the programs we do, talk to Eve at the end. You can talk to me. Um, NYC Well. Lisa First is here from Mental Health Association, is a great service funded by Thrive NYC, and I think there's some brochures uh, out in front. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have a primary care physician like Dr. Lax, go to your primary care physician. Um, we can comment about the fact that primary care physicians are really um, shielding the uh, um, the burden of the mental health, but any, something's better than nothing, and that's really important. Um, find quality care, because we know that without that quality care, um, you're more likely to drop out of treatment and have poor quality of life. So I think on that note, I'm going to stop. So thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Does this work? I'm going to try and talk into the microphone as well as I can, even though I'm not generally a fan of microphones. So thank you for bearing with me. So I hope everybody is uh, enjoying the nice air conditioning as I am. As a sociologist, I come from this, uh, I come into this topic from a bit of a different angle. And so I'm really going to focus on that neighborhood piece that uh, Mark and Joanne so nicely uh, alluded to and, and take a little bit of a different tag and introduce you to the older adults, at least two of them, that I spent more than, well, I would say about five years with observing and trying to understand how they are experiencing a lot of the challenges that you do face at this later part of life um, in the community. And so um, my talk today will focus on um, the social support that people were able to find in these semi-public places we have all over New York City and we're blessed to have right outside our doorstep, it's focusing on coffee shops, diners, fast food joints like McDonald's. Um, and this is where the older people I spent time with, so all over the age of 65, but um, uh, in their 70s, 80s, uh, even 90s, um, how they develop less conventional uh, forms of social support. So these people are not joiners. They have told me in interviews and when I observed them that they did not want to go to the senior center. Um, in the words of one of the people that I'll introduce you to, he said, I don't want to go play mahjong all day. I hate old people. And, and he is, he's about 80 
really had to tell me this. He's 92 now, and he's still not going to the senior center. And so these are people who are not, you know, joining the book club and not heavily involved in church. So where do they find social support, and how do doctors um, who are seeking to help people deal with um, in mental health issues as they crop up, how do we find these people? Because you're not going to find them in certain places. Um, so this all began when I stumbled across a little bakery on the west side of Manhattan. It had been in existence since 1962. And um, as gentrification is speeding along, I said, wow, how is this place even still in business? It was fossilized in time. It had um, just eight tables arranged in a rectangle where people could dip in and out of conversations. Um, even people would complain, although I think affectionately, that the, the, the furniture was distressed. There were like holes in the plastic tablecloths. Um, but, but the older people that I spent time with were able to access this place. And so it was centrally located between a large housing projects complex, uh, low equity co-ops, which were set up to be affordable by garment workers unions, and um, a handful of people still holding on and living in um, rent-controlled apartments and rent-stabilized departments that hadn't turned market rate. Um, and so the people that would spend time in this place were aging in place, and you hear this term a lot. And so they had not moved to Florida. They had lots of friends in Florida. I'm sure everybody knows people in Florida. Um, they were not in a nursing home, and so they were really uh, managing to stay in the community. But they face challenges, and so this is what this book that I'm working on uh, looks at. It's how are they dealing with challenges like living alone, facing health declines, um, going to the grocery shop, making their medical appointments. How are they dealing with this in um, kind of a heated you know, real estate market where they're dealing with also gentrification, cost of living issues as you know, uh, things are getting more expensive and their incomes are not growing. Um, and it focuses on the opportunities that they still had to build these relationships that were very supportive. So whether it meant uh, people giving them information or people loaning money in some circumstances or people um, calling on their behalf to the building department when um, a landlord was trying to take somebody to housing court for no reason because he lived in a apartment that was about a thousand bucks a month and there were million dollar condominium or co-ops or whatever at this point it was in there um you know down the hall um so um, as I said, in this large project, and I spent time with a lot of people facing um, the kinds of issues that we've been hearing about today, I'm going to season on two portraits. I'm also going to check my watch just to make sure I'm not going over. Um, so for the first person, Mr. I don't want to go to senior centers because I don't want to play mahjong and I hate old people, Eugene, um, as I call him. He's 92, and um, he is a very affable and funny man. He's popular amongst the regulars that he spent um, time with daily at this neighborhood bakery. Um, and he was also, especially in the eyes of people who were kind of dealing with the transition to retirement and trying to figure out ways to recreate the routines that they had before in their working life, they had a lot of time on their hands, some people. He was a working writer, and he's still a working writer. And so he has written like 50 books on nutrition, and he was writing like a children's book, and he had started a novel. And so he really was able to keep himself quite busy um, when he was in the house writing and he had you know daily conversations with his literary agent but also spending time with people in the neighborhood um, but he had dealt with serious health declines and so he had had um, a broken hip at one point and that limited his mobility severely in fact I remember there was a moment when he was um, in his late 80s where he said you know this is the first time I'm not going to renew my passport and he had traveled all over over the world. So his world was shrinking and his networks were shrinking. He also said, you know, all my friends are dead at this point. Um, he had also dealt with financial issues and so he was the person that was dragged to housing court because, you know, the building claimed that there was some smell coming out of his apartment. Um, uh oh. Should I keep going? I don't know. Is this too. Disregard. Okay. Okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay, I think the test is over. No, no. Okay. Well, that's good. At least the place isn't burning down. Let me get through my presentation, sir. Um, 
Anyway, and this is all recorded, so that'll make for a fun video. Um, <laughs> So Eugene had dealt with these health declines, and he was also dealing with financial issues. He was dealing with harassment um, from his building, and he was literally outliving his savings. And so he had received Social Security. I'm not sure quite what his pension situation was, but you know, basically he had once had $80,000 in the bank. He used he drew a little bit of it each year, and by the time he was 90, you know, it was all gone. Um, and so that led actually him to a deep depression. Um, and he was hospitalized for three weeks in a psychiatric unit, and he was he was planning to commit suicide. And um, the thing is, we would gather at this neighborhood place, and one day he didn't appear, and we were really surprised. And then he didn't appear again, and he didn't appear again. And people asked, you know, his doorman, like, where is he? Have you seen him around? And finally, because I had been spending time with so many people, I was actually in touch with his sister, who lives in Dallas, Texas. He's originally from Texas, but he had lived here for 50 years and um, she called around and she was just really expecting the worst at that point and at this point uh, she told me that she had located him and so the neighborhood piece is really just one part it's really important and um, he was able to reach out to actually one of his friends from his magazine editing days who called the police and they brought him to the hospital and um, the whole thing that triggered the situation was that he was expecting a royalty check check of $4,000 from one of his books, and he really needed that to um, make ends meet, and the check was only for $30. And he, so he was dealt that huge blow. And so for the price of $4,000, he was you know, considering the worst. Um, but so he was able to, though, through these years, and I think that this was um, very helpful in sustaining him, even though he claimed that all of his friends had passed away, um, that there were these other people in the neighborhood. Some of them he knew their names. Some of them they didn't. He didn't quite consider them close friends, because you know, if you've had people that you've lost that were close friends for decades, it's hard to have these relationships equivalent in the minds of at least the people that um, I spent time with. But you know, when he was in the hospital, when he broke his um, hip, more than 20 people from that little bakery showed up to visit him. Um, they took him out to his birth um, for dinner at his birthday at this local diner. Uh, when he needed money, one of the women that he had met with daily in this situation and afterwards, she loaned him some money, and so she was able to tide him over. Then his sister became more involved in the situation. She was able to um, give him a little bit more uh, extra financial support every month. So um, I guess what I'm saying here is that you know these places. Um, it's an interesting situation because. Because it's kind of, at least the places that I uh, was spending time in, it wasn't exactly where everybody knows your name. If you think back to that cheer sitcom from the 80s that we all love, sometimes even people, they create a distance. They didn't quite want to know everybody's name. There's a lot of uh, responsibility attached to having these close ties, or as um, Joanne had pointed out. And, and the, the closer you are with people, the more you might hesitate to let them know about mental health issues because you fear the stigma or judgment or w whatever the person is worried about. But these kind of places gave um, my research participants a place to go every day. As one of my, um, as one of the women in the study said, who had also suffered from some depression, but it manifested in a different way, she said, well, you got to get out of bed, you got to put your lipstick on every day and go out there. And so these places enabled people to go out there. Um, and so I would say kind of to end on this last note, since I don't have time, I don't think, for another portrait, is that um, they're really important, but they're also precarious. And so as we know, as we spend time in New York City neighborhoods where um, retail rents are going up and, 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 and stores are closing, whether it's a Panera or a McDonald's or a little neighborhood place, that there's a whole thriving community potentially there that we don't always see but is there and is kind of ready in the wings when something happens to step in. So thank you and thank you for bearing with this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think the test for me was out. Well, we'll hope it's a short test. I want to 
first off, just thank all three of our panelists who um, who brought extraordinary knowledge, but also diversity to the discussion. Is my phone making noise? How rude of it. Sorry. <laughs> I meant to say earlier, everyone turn off their phones. I didn't do that, and apparently I didn't listen. Um, so I have many questions already here in front of me, and I've got more coming. So let me just, I'm not going to aim them at any specific person. If each of you want to answer, any of you want to answer, great. So the first one is from someone who's a 70-year-old female. I have a problem sleeping through the night. Mostly I find myself sleeping only till around 5 a.m. Um, is this usual? And recently I started napping in the afternoons. So is that a symptom of depression? Is that simply a reality of an aging body? Because um, I'm actually doing the same thing except I don't have time to nap. <laughs> <laughs> Now you can, can you hear me? So I think it depends, right? It depends whether that's the only thing that the person is facing. If they're sleeping, if they're having difficulty sleeping, having difficulty concentrating, what I like to ask people is, when, you know, when was the last time you read a good book or an article? Oh, I used to read, but I don't read anymore. I'm feeling like life isn't kind of worth what it used to be. So I would be looking for the other set of symptoms. Um, you know, we're not going to make a diagnosis of depression just based on a sleep difficulty. I have difficulty sleeping too. So um, I think it's really, we're looking for a constellation of symptoms. So I would say, you know, this is something that you should really talk about with the primary care doctor. And the primary care doctor might say... Well, sleep uh, disruption is a, is a symptom. Uh, it can be a symptom of depression. There are a bunch of associated findings when there's sleep problems and depression. For example, waking up and worrying is one symptom. Not feeling refreshed in the morning. Uh, so those are some of the, the symptoms. Early morning awakening can be a symptom of, uh, of depression. Uh, but there are many other medical conditions that can produce uh, sleep disturbance. Medications can do that. Conditions like sleep apnea can cause people to have restless sleep at night uh, and, uh, and, and, and napping during the day and cause a bunch of other medical problems, including memory loss. So, uh, you know, again, the, uh, the goal is to make sure that these things are properly evaluated as opposed to simply dismissed uh, to aging. Uh, you know, aging is not a disease. There are diseases that are more common as people age. And at this point, I must tell my favorite geriatric uh, uh, parable joke, which is, you know, Mr. Smith goes to the doctor and he says, uh, uh, you know, doctor, my left leg hurts. And uh, the doctor says, well, Mr. Smith, how old are you? He says, uh, I'm 88 years old. And the doctor says, well, what do you expect at your age? And Mr. Smith gets up rather defiantly and says, uh, the problem with that explanation is my other leg is also 88 and it doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's, a serious, there's a serious point to that joke, which is when we begin to dismiss uh, medical complaints as, uh, age, as, as old age, we begin to get lazy and miss things. And what a terrible message that is, to, what a ter terrible fatalistic message that is uh, to patients. To, you know, the, look, there are diseases uh, I can I can't sometimes fix or make symptoms uh, improve significantly, but I, I, patients need to know that I've left no stone unturned in trying to take their complaints seriously. So uh, that's what I would say about that. Excellent. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. Could you speak about the connection between chronic pain, arthritis, et cetera, pain management, and mental health issues in the, the term they use is the old, old? Sometimes I think we talk about the frail elderly. Well, we're missing the, the world expert right. on this, right? Dr. Carrie Reed, who um, is a colleague of ours at the Wright Center in Geriatrics, is really the world expert um, on chronic pain and the management and alternative managements of chronic pain. Um, what I can tell you that from the depression standpoint, we frequently see people who have chronic pain, um, and that's common. Um, I can't, you know, I. 
I, I think that we haven't done the very, very good research to document exactly how this unfolds, but anybody who's had chronic pain knows what a burden that is, and we often see the new onset of a medical illness or a disability can trigger a depression. Um, so, I, you know, I think they do often go hand in hand, um, so we can see higher rates among people who have chronic pain, and also, again, with people who have depression, we see higher rates of chronic pain, so depending on how you look at it. There's an interplay between pain and depression. If you are depressed and you have pain, it colors the experience of pain, and pain's a risk factor for depression. Uh, uh, again, pain is inadequately addressed in older people. And it's particularly challenging because the medications um, can cause cognitive and other side effects like constipation, so we have to be particularly judicious. I will say this about pain. Some of the most compelling data in complementary and alternative medicine uh, is around pain management, and it's not necessarily vitamins and supplements. It's actually various forms of exercise, physical therapy, guided imagery, yoga. There's an article in today's Journal of Annals of Internal Medicine, so our central journal you know, among the sort of uh, internal medicine uh, academic mafia, if you will, okay? <laughs> and it's a study that compared yoga to, uh, to long courses of physical therapy for back pain and found yoga to be um, uh, uh, equivalent uh, to costly physical therapy and probably more enjoyable. So, uh, you know, as I like to say to my patient, uh, you know, motion is lotion, okay? <laughs> Um, I would also add, too, that the people that I spend so much time with, I, as much as people would say behind their back, oh, I don't want to hear about everybody complaining about their aches and pains all day, everybody chimed in, and I think that it was important that they could also compare with people that were, you know, of their same sort of age or dealing with certain uh, similar issues to be able to vent a little and to get information. So somebody would say, I mean, using that sleep uh, situation, there was one woman who had always been been a very light sleeper, had large blocks um, of the evening where she was awake. So she would look out the window and she would hear things and like report back about these scenes she saw because she lived on a bit busy avenue. Meanwhile, there was another person, he was a really light sleeper and there was somebody making noise above him. And this just really got him down. You know, he was waking up later and he was just really suffering from it. Um, so I think, you know, being able to talk to people, um, whomever they are, you know, you may be able to um, not only feel not alone, but get uh, the resources that you need. And, and to kind of piggyback on that idea of alternative medicine, one participant who had a lot of chronic pain, her, I mean, not to put down anybody in the medical establishment, but her, or like the traditional medical establishment, she had a lot of, she had a lot of complaints about doctors, but she felt like she wasn't always being listened to, that, you know, she just didn't have enough time with people so that they could connect the dots. But she went to this acupuncturist, and this person was able to kind of put these things together and look at her body as a whole system in a way that she wasn't able to experience when she went to the doctors, and everybody was like, okay, like, what's up with your elbow, and what's up with your jaw? What's up with your pinky uh, toe? Um, so I would just also say for people who may be experiencing this, and I have a chronic autoimmune condition as well, and so I was able to sort of chime in too and, and get resources from the people that I was spending time with. I'm like, okay, my problem is right now that I sleep too much. But, and so they would also take care of me as well. Great. You know, and the discussions about loneliness and anxiety all tying into this, and then the story of, I guess, your... Um, your sociological story about the gentleman who didn't want to go to senior centers because he didn't like old people in Mahjong. My grandmother was 90 and she said, I can't stand old people, so don't suggest all these things. And then she said, you know what, I'm going to go to college. I never went to college. Mm. And she wasn't here in New York, but just for you to know, most of the colleges around here actually do offer incredible discounts and even specialized programs for seniors. So my grandmother started college at 90 and went until she was 97. Oh, wow. And she would walk to the campus every day a mile and back. Mm -hmm. And she got to hang out with the young people who were no doubt all going, oh my God, who is this woman and what is she doing here? Um, but that's, she recognized she was suffering from loneliness. She had outlived my grandfather by an enormous number of years. And she was like, well, we have to do something about that. It was just, you reminded me of that story. 
How does one find a therapist who specializes in the older generation and these issues and accepts Medicare? Yes. Ooh. I knew that was going to yeah. get that response. We knew that was coming. We knew that was coming. So that's, it is a challenge. There's, um, so one of the things we didn't talk a lot is the tremendous shortage in um, prov mental health providers who are trained to work with older adults. There are some really great mental health providers, but they really are much more expert in the 20-something-year-old. So, um, and Mark mentioned Medicare. Medicare is a, it's better than some, but a lot worse than others. Um, so, and a lot of the um, individuals who are out practicing are not accepting Medicare. So that doesn't answer the question, it just highlights the challenge. So, um, I would say there are a number of different ways. You can, first of all, New York NYC Well, I think, is a resource. This is something that you can call. They have, Lisa, do they have information specifically on people who are expert in later yeah. life? It doesn't make the age group of whoever you're seeking help for, whether it's yourself or a loved one, and you can say it's for older adults who have Medicare, and they can search the database and see what might be available. Great. So, um, so NYC Well is available if you are on. Uh oh. Okay. All right. Okay, fine. Okay. Thank you for the notification. Um, <laughs> really? Right, right, right. Okay. All right. Don't you feel safer now? All right. Okay. Um, the other thing is, if you, you know, if you are living um, on the Upper East Side, or especially in White Plains, um, which I know you're not, but um, call and you think you're looking for some treatment for depression, please call our free screen screening number. Um, we do have both referrals to therapists as well as research studies. Um, the research studies are particularly great because treatment is free um, for people who are eligible and you get to spend time with um, our fabulous research assistants who are wonderful 20-something year olds who want to go into this field. Um, but if you're not interested in research or you don't qualify, we actually provide as many referrals as we possibly can. We make it our business to try and find people who we know are in the community who accept Medicare because it is such a challenge. Right. So, Thank you. Okay. Oh, the referral number? The referral number is, and you'll correct me if I say my number instead of the other one because they're very close. <laughs> it's 914-997-4331. Um, and uh, it's a 914 number because we have offices both in White Plains and New York City. So please feel free to call. Don't be put off by the 914. Um, and you can give a call and it's answered very frequently. Again, the number is 914 Nine nine seven four three three one, and our ac expertise is really in depression and anxiety, and we can get referrals. Um, so feel free to give us a call. Um, also, as I said, Eve is in the back. So if you don't want to call and you just want to put your Eve, see Eve, right. there's Eve. Um, Eve has a list. If you just want to give us your name and number, we'll call you, um, and we're we're totally fine about doing that. So. So feel free. Great. So those are two resources available. Thank you. The number one more time. 914-997-4331. Great, thank you. And I'd like to give a shout out to someone else in the back. Um, our city council member, Ben Kalos, has joined us. He's the tall young man standing there in the back. Hi, Ben. Thank you for joining us. Um, always enjoy doing work with Ben. He's an activist council member, and he won't be a senior citizen for a long time. <laughs> Although I have to pull out this card because someone wrote it saying it's comic relief, but it's a it's a very real issue. And in fact, my own cousin every time I send out an email accuses me of thinking he's much older than he is. He's like, why are you sending me all these issues for seniors? <laughs> I'm like, it's not personal. I do email blasts, and some of the information is for seniors. And frankly, you're close, so get over yourself. <laughs> um, but in fact, the comic relief point was, can we get, should we pass a bill that forbids the press or broadcasters for referring to those of us at 55 years and older as elderly? 
And you know, it's a fascinating discussion because there were statistics in, what, in your presentation about the growing population of people who are seniors. And there's the recognition that as our population ages and we live longer, there is a larger percentage of the population who are older, but there's also all these categories, literally of decades, when you in fact can be a senior. And so you might be a senior at age 60 legally for certain benefits that you would even want to make sure you have. But let's be honest, a 60 year old today is probably not facing that many parallel issues to an 89 year old or a 99 year old. And that it's really important for us almost to have new language so that we actually can deal with better and serve people better across the entire, I don't guess, universe or spectrum of aging years. And I'm sure that that must apply in medical care as well, because again, 60, 90, it's 30 years apart. 60 is the uh, newborn nursery where I work. <laughs> 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 I think your mic's not on. Oh, your yeah. mic's not working. Yeah. Great. Oh. I was saying that uh, 60 is the newborn nursery and, uh, and 80 is the adolescent unit. Um, but, uh, you, uh, you know, I, I, I do not like, I personally don't like the term elderly. Um, it's like the Martians, you know. Um, I prefer older adults, personally. Mm -hmm. um, it's more descriptive. And, you know, I was just going to say the other thing is when you flip it the other way and, and think it, you know, we don't expect adults who are from age 20 to 60 to look the same. Why would we expect 60 to 100 year olds? To look? You know, so, I mean, I, I feel like I, I, I've been at the hospital for 27 years um, and I trained at a time when um, the whole idea of looking at development in later life was considered novel. I mean, it, you know, in the 1980s, later life was begun to be seen, and that, that started in adulthood as a, play, a time of development. So, you know, think about it more positively, which is that I think things are changing. And I think the fact that we can really talk about it and think about it and uh, learn about it is, is the optimistic take on this. But yeah, the terminology is not great. Yeah, to add sort of a sociological uh, perspective on the matter. So we study life course, and if you look at the earlier part of the life course, it's so subdivided all the way up until, you know, you're kind of a young adult. So you have your, you could be a toddler, you could be a baby, you could be like a preschooler, you're kind of elementary school age. Then, you know, marketing people got on to tweens, and we're going to divide that up. And then like in the 50s and 60s, kind of the American teenager was invented. And then we have like people going through quarter life, and now you have the millennials and you know it's only kind of a newer newer understanding of uh, later life where yeah 60 year old has um, very different issues and some similar issues you might be transitioning to retirement and having to kind of figure out the third act of, of your life and what are you going to do and, and that can be quite exciting too and um, I mean I tend to in my writing although sometimes like it might have been in the New York Times like they, they put elderly in and I'm like okay fine it's a New York Times I'm not going to argue with them too too <laughs> much, but I tend to just use the terminology older adults, older people, even senior citizens. Sometimes some people like seniors, some people don't. You know, we want to like younger citizens. So younger people, older people, that's kind of the language I try to um, to, to stick to. And then understanding that, you know, there you can be sort of younger old or middle old or old old. And as the um, life expectancy is going up and up, who knows what we'll have in another few years. Right. Thank you. So now I found a series of questions that I knew we were going to get to, because how could we not? It's all about cognitive concerns, dementia, Alzheimer's. People get worried and fearful they're going to get Alzheimer's or they're getting Alzheimer's. Worried what are the chances they're going to get it? How do they get um, evaluated for it? Are there things that can be done to help slow it down? Um, you know, they read about mental exercises, stimulation. Are there drugs that delay it or can stop it? 
I will tell you, I know it's not true, but if you work in government and you're working in a community, you actually just start to assume like one out of four people um, above a certain age have some stage of, con of cognitive dysfunction. You know, I don't think the stats are that high, although I don't know that we know, um, but it's an enormous challenge and the overlap between, it's a cognitive set of illnesses, right? but it clearly can trigger mental health concerns. It's very hard, in my experience, to know chicken and egg, mm -hmm. how you deal with it. It certainly falls into Dr. Lack's category of you're seeing your primary care physician. Um, my own father died of Alzheimer's just a couple of months ago, but was still working and would even say things like, he was in banking, he go, do you have any money in the bank I work for? No, Dad, I don't. That's good. They think I know what I'm doing. No one should have money here. So he had enough self-awareness to know there was something maybe seriously wrong about the fact that he was still in this profession, um, but actually sometimes couldn't remember his name um, or where he was. So I'm just, I'm just throwing all those things at you as a group because I don't think there's anyone in this room who probably doesn't have direct experience with someone in their own lives who has been suffering from or is suffering from you know, cognitive um, issues that are correlated to a whole series of illnesses that all seem to fall under the umbrella of dementia and that are often age correlated. Well, sadly, the uh, statistics that you cited are not terribly far off, Liz. Uh, and, uh, you know, the dementia is an epidemic, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, and it, it's, its incidence is age-dependent. Uh, it's a few percent in the 60s, uh, 5 or 10 percent in the 70s, and, and rises considerably in the 80s and 90s. Um, so so in, in people over the age of 85, uh, in all walks of life and, and, and living in the community, living in nursing homes, if you carefully test, not just brief testing in the doctor's office, if you really look for it, you can find it you know, in upwards of 30 or 40 percent of people, some degree of impairment. That doesn't mean that people aren't functioning, driving, working. Uh, the medications for dementing illness and uh, this group of diseases like Alzheimer's disease uh, sadly are not terribly effective. Uh, drugs like Aricept, Exelon, drugs you've probably heard about. Uh, quite candidly, the drugs we have for depression are much more effective. Uh, and I should all po also point out that, um, that um, depression can masquerade and be misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease or a dementing illness, okay, because depression can produce only memory loss, another reason to get well evaluated. But here I'm going to um, sort of uh, um, sing the praises of another part of the institution you're sitting in, which is uh, uh, our biomedical sciences program. And uh, I'm deeply worried about cuts to the National Institutes of Health, but uh, some of the most compelling research in the world is going on, on on these three corners here around neurodegenerative disease, like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, vascular dementias. And uh, I believe that in the next decade or two, you're going to see compelling breakthroughs. We should all be supporting uh, that kind of science. We should be supporting stem cell research and epigenetic, uh, all kinds of research that go on here. I'm, I'm incredibly hopeful. Uh, I would point out that these diseases exist um, because we fixed a bunch of other diseases, right? So 40 or 50 years ago, you would have died of a heart attack in your 40s or 50. Now we have a coronal cardiologist who puts a piece of rigatoni in one of your arteries, okay? Uh, and you get to live to meet me, okay? It's 40 or 50 years later. Or you have a colon cancer that would have felled you, but you got a colonoscopy, something we didn't do until the 1970s or the 1980s. So ironically, it is the successes of uh, places like this since World War II and all the money we've invested uh, in, um, in biomedicine and, and science that has led people to live later with a different set of issues, issues like macular degeneration, issues like, like, like uh, mobility issues with arthritis, late life depression, 
uh, um, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so uh, there are going to be effective treatments for Alzheimer's disease in the next decade, more effective than we have. And if you want to be involved as a, as a patient or a, or a donor or a, or a lobbyist, uh, to speak to your representative to make sure that this research gets funded um, because there's some amazing breakthroughs uh, just around the pike. Great. And, you know, it's, it seems like we should also talk about um, some of the research in terms of cognitive flexibility and things like that. I mean, uh, you know, I think it used to be um, that, you know, we would uh, hear a lot about these um, computerized games. And I think there is a role, and we, we actually use some of them in uh, cognitive remediation in, in terms of uh, creating neuroplasticity. And so I think there is a role. But I, I think it was the New York Times recently kind of said it's the most important thing is to keep learning, keep moving, keep changing. I like the try and eat with the other hand. I tried that one. That was not so easy, you know? Um, but constantly moving. And then when you begin to look at these... Um, um, the data that says that when you retire, that's where things start to, it's not, it's not that retirement is inherently, it's if we retire, and you know, when I was growing up, retirement meant you move to your um, uh, barker lounger, right, and you watch TV, and if you stop learning and you stop thinking, the brain also changes as well. And so, and the brain does age like every other organ in the body, and so I think, um, you know, the, the best uh, advice I think out there is to keep learning, to keep vital, and you know, to not, to try and discourage yourself from I think what the biggest challenge is, is when we face the limitations that we have, whether they're cognitive or physical, it's easy to get discouraged. It's easier to throw up your hands, you know, and kind of withdraw rather than say, okay, I'm in, I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna talk to somebody, I'm gonna do something like that. So I think that's, that's my pitch for the things that, again, not my area of expertise, but things that I think uh, make a difference. I don't know if you... I, I, I agree, and some of the most compelling data um, around uh, maintaining cognition really are around socialization, yeah. exercise. I mean, what we're doing here, actually, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is, you know, and, and by the way, this is not toxic chemotherapy to have a few friends, <laughs> okay? I mean, it's not like if it doesn't work, it hasn't, it's not like you've, You've poisoned yourself. I guess it depends on the friend. Yeah. Okay, but uh, 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 but uh, but um, so uh, you know, socialization is uh, we think in gerontology is is the fix to a great many problems, uh, depression, perhaps cognitive problems, elder abuse, the area that I work in. We think that keeping people engaged uh, intergenerationally, particularly, is is very compelling. Yeah, I would just add, too, that socializing also doesn't have to be so hard sometimes, as I, as I found with spending time with, with, you know, these people that were just in neighborhood places, and then they would become regulars, and then they would kind of get to know each other. Because even I know I can be daunted when I hear about these crossword puzzles. I frankly hate crossword puzzles. So I'm always like, okay, I, I, what am I going to do? Because this is not going to work for me. Um, but just spending time with people, um, and I'm also not so much of a joiner. It takes me a while to, like, get into a dance class, or, like, I'm not joining a book club, but, uh, I mean, that's just not, I'm, I'm the table for me but so it doesn't also have to be so hard it can just be baby steps it could just be kind of going out more or you know initiating a conversation with somebody you see around and um you might need a new friend as well so thank you i'm get you know these cards are filled with actual recommendations as well as questions so i i just wanted to highlight we also had a guest here in the back came up from langone's alzheimer's mm -hmm. Um, support program. Okay. She's waving her hand in the oh. back for anybody who wants also to reach out. Hi guys, Hi. ladies. Um, there's somebody here running um, an adult day program for people with Alzheimer's. Hello. Um, who also, you know, strongly encourages more coordination and socialization and perhaps the medical students want to visit the adult daycare program as well. I don't know who wrote this down, but they win the prize the new term for seniors, the chrono chronologically gifted. Oh. Ah, thank you. <laughs> that lady very fair is getting the prize tonight, the chronologically gifted. All right, we will quickly steal that from you because I love, so patent it right away or trademark it. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, um, I have an ex-staffer who left me to go start a social movement called radical aging mm -hmm. uh, 
Okay, people have already known about that. So find Alice Fisher and the radical aging movement efforts on the web. Um, that is another good source of work. Oh, so many things. Oh, we also have, I just, among the many sponsors tonight is a group called Search and Care. Is anyone here from Search and Care? Oh, hello, you're right there. Okay, so Search and Care does amazing work with vo mostly volunteers working with people, mostly seniors, if not all seniors, I'm sorry, chronic, chronologically gifted people in our community <laughs> provide an, an enormous array of services and assistance and home visits. So take a look at their materials because it's like everybody needs a guardian angel and unfortunately we can't assign one to everyone who needs one. But I sort of define search and care as, you know, when you're in, when you're in need of a guardian angel. Um, go through and find search and care. Um, some people are, yes, yes, applaud, applause. Um, okay, people are talking about alternate exercises. We already heard about the idea of yoga, pointing out, you know, in addition to medical models, Tai Chi, yoga. I think all of you have talked about the importance of getting out there and continuing physical activity. And it actually has a real impact on your psychology as well as your physical body. This is specifically for Dr. Suri. The PHQ-9 questionnaire doesn't mention some of the symptoms that Dr. Lack spoke about that are different in older people when it comes to depression irritability, but not necessarily sad. Is there something about this questionnaire that people should just think about when you're dealing with older people? Yeah, no, it, you know, and it's interesting because as I said, it's used a lot as a self-report and you can use it as a self-report, but when we do it face-to-face, uh, -face, we include irritability. So this is a standardized measure. It's as good as they come, but you're absolutely right. What we also, um, you know, we did, and um, and Pfizer probably uh, accepted it, but I gave you the traditional version, is we reorganize things, too, because if you start with these, uh, you start with depressed and down, people go, oh, no, or they say to me, what, do you think I'm crazy? And I say, no, I'm not. I ask this of everybody. So um, you're absolutely right. Irritability is not on there, and I think this was a more generic um, questionnaire that was designed for wide use. Um, so, yeah, for younger people, right. It's just, you know, it's widely used and it's a good observation. And another approach to this, yes. are there blood tests that can confirm biological changes for depression or anxiety or measure the progress during therapy? Can you take a blood test and see whether you're depressed or you're I less wish. depressed today than oh, yesterday? I wish, I wish, you know, in my lifetime, maybe. Um, no, we can, we can take blood tests to check on therapeutic blood levels um, to see how, um, how concentrated the medication is when you're on a medication, but no, we can't. Um, I hope someday we will um, because, you know, maybe it will be, but you know, um, right now, we still have the same model that we've had when I went to graduate school, which is a diathesis stress model, which is some combination of the brain and the biology and the environment. And that's unfortunately the best we can do at this point. And you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in depression. Some people have suffered from depression throughout their lives, and they can tell you that they, you know, at very stressful periods of time or changes in their endocrine system, they've gotten depressed. Then I see the individual comes into my office, led a resilient life, um, faced numerous stressors, walks in at the age of 76, and they're depressed for the first time. So there's a tremendous range in the kind of depressions that we see and the way depression affects, affects people. So we really can't diagnose it in that way. It's very heterogeneous. Great. Thank you. Okay, so competing for chronologically gifted. <laughs> Someone else in the audience thinks that elder connotes wisdom and knowledge in older people. So some people don't love elderly, but some people like elder. Um, and I respect that. We get to all call ourselves whatever we wish, as far as I'm concerned. 
So we heard about, in one of your presentations, the correlation between depression and stroke, and I think we can visualize that pretty easily. But there's also, I think, um, there's questions, there are two questions here. Um, confirmation of depression being triggered by heart attacks or heart surgery, and also cancer treatment. So is it the actual disease that correlates to depression or your or the medications and treatment you have to go through for them? I mean, you know, chemotherapy can be pretty debilitating, um, even if there's nothing else going on. So, you know, cart and horse between these other illnesses, their treatments, and mental health. Yeah, you know, again, I would, I, one of the things that's really interesting is that when a new medical condition unfolds, it may be the first time that a depressed person is being very thoroughly evaluated. So we may have somebody who had depression throughout, and this is a kind of a critical moment that that depression is being diagnosed, or it could be because there's a significant medical event that is both psychologically stressful and biologically stressful that that precipitates a depression. And you know, this is where um, I, I think we would need lovely longitudinal studies. We do know that depression in these, um, after a heart attack and after a stroke, does change the course of recovery. That we know. Um, sometimes we have a harder time untangling which came first. Yeah, in the case of, uh, I'll just give you, this is very difficult to disentangle. I'll, I'll give you the example of bypass surgery. So when the surgeons uh, operate uh, on you to do bypass surgery, uh, you're put on a bypass machine so that uh, blood is not flowing through the heart, and the blood pressure is kept very low because the surgeon likes not a lot of bleeding in the field as he's, he or she is working. Uh, and that is hypothesized to produce, in some patients, post-operative uh, uh, transient memory impairment, but also depression. On the other hand, you can imagine uh, going to your cardiologist's office and told you need a bypass tomorrow as somewhat uh, <laughs> depressogenic, I think, right? So, so, it's, so, it's, so it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a one-two punch. So it's very difficult to disentangle the, the, the card or the horse, as you were describing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is, you know, that's part of why we pitch screening. I try and stay away from discussions about etiology because we really don't know what causes what. And, you know, the PHQ-9 with its limitations is a slice of, t you know, of symptoms in time. It doesn't say you were depressed, you will be depressed. I liken it to, you know, when I go to Stop and Shop and I put my arm in the blood pressure machine, if the numbers come up high, it's not that I have blood pressure, it means I need to go to the the doctor and get the doctor to do it. So think about it as a slice in time because we really don't know what came first. And sometimes looking at you know what came first or the etiology can be an obstacle. It can keep people from seeking care. You know, my favorite story is the, the woman who came in for psychotherapy and, and um, she had had a course of psychotherapy and I recommended medication and she said, it's not, you know, what's medication gonna do about my husband? He's the source of the problem, you know? And it's like, we, we're, you know, we are, we are active animals. We construct our lives. We have models of how we think the world works. Um, and we try and fit our models to what we do. So, you know, so I would discourage you, it's, these are important questions and for educational purposes, they're really valuable to think about them. And, you know, if you know somebody's had a stroke and that sort of thing, but don't get too caught up in it because I think it's really the slice in time is the most useful piece of information. I, I just have to chime in because uh, one of my, one of my women patients this morning, uh, whose husband recently retired, I asked her, how she regarded her husband's retirement, uh, she said that twice the man, half the money. <laughs> <laughs> we, lo we love the field. We yeah, love the field. It's, it's kind of hard to top that, but I wanted to add one thing too. Um, 
anecdotally, as somebody who's had you know cancer survivors in my family, my father particularly, who has had like four kinds of cancer over a 10 year period and still here, that's actually the last time I was here. We brought him to be evaluated for a surgery and um, thankfully he's okay. But he's he's faced a lot of limitations. You know, in terms of like your life changes, it's not just the chemo and the radiation, but it's like, oh, now I'm dealing with this other thing. Uh, I can't walk maybe as far as I used to. I get tired or short of breath when I didn't used to. And um, the portrait I presented of this this man, Eugene, he had had a heart attack. And after that, I mean, he, he was very lucky. He had it when he was at the VA hospital. He was just going for an appointment and had the heart attack there. So when he didn't show up, he showed up the next day, got right off the bus. And he said, well, I was there, saw the whole thing happen. But, the, it, it, but it even cut his sort of range outside of his doorstep. You know, he was able to walk maybe a block without getting heavily um, out of breath. And so these things, you know, it's, it's, it's again, there is a slice in time, but there's, it's a long-term process. So just keeping, keeping uh, on top of that and understanding that as things change, you need to check in with people. So we know that there's a substance abuse problem throughout our society. Mm -hmm. We know in younger people that there is substance abuse that correlates to mental health. We've all heard the term self-medicating with drugs or alcohol rather than actually getting the help one needs. We know that there's um, addictive types of personalities that correlate to certain things. Does that all go away when you hit 60 and up? Does it speed up? Well, I knew, but it was, does it speed up when you hit 60 and up? What's the patterns of substance abuse and mental health issues among chronologically gifted or our wise elders? Yeah, that, I, I hope we didn't drive people out. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I can tell you a little bit about what I see in the community when I, uh, in the research that we've been doing, is that we see um, a number of people who used to drink in the past and they don't drink, and a lot of non-drinkers. We also see people um, who have been drinking throughout their lives and continue, and I focus on alcohol because we do a lot of screening for alcohol use. Um, you know, it, it's, it, I think things don't change. Um, the other thing that we know is, is that um, there are a lot of medications that are being offered to older adults for chronic pain, for other things. If, you know, um, my soapbox, and, and it should really come from Dr. Lax, but, you know, is people who are given benzodiazepines, they're given Valium, they're giving Xanax because they're anxious or mm -hmm. because there's, you know, they're stressed. And the person who gives it to them um, doesn't and say, by the way, this is addictive. This is a rescue medication. You take it only when it's absolutely necessary. And by the way, it can increase your risk of falls. It may actually take its toll on your cognitive functioning over time. So, you know, I think it, it, it the substance abuse that you saw earlier in life, if somebody is luck, lucky enough to abuse substances throughout their life and live into later life, it often continues. Sometimes people have a wake up call, but most of the seniors that we see um, have really kind of limited because of um, the health risks. Um, so we see a lot of variability and, and you know again remember I'm out doing research in the community and there are a lot of people who don't want to tell you about what they're using or not using. You know? Okay, I think I'm going to make this the final question for the evening. And there were a few more that I couldn't take partly because some of them I couldn't read the handwriting so well, I apologize. And a couple were very personal and I don't think I want to go into the whole detail here. But many older, older New Yorkers have real limitations about their ability to get to doctors and get out there for appointments. And they really need people who can come to their home, mm -hmm. even for diagnosis and, and treatment. Do those options exist anywhere? So we do have a house call program here at Cornell. Um, I made one this morning. Um, uh, it's limited for patients who, uh, uh, for reasons of uh, immobility, if someone aged in a walk up, or mm -hmm. uh, reasons of mental health, or um, homebound. Although I did run into my homebound patient in the liquor store a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> uh, uh, and, no, um, that self-medication yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but uh, you know, and uh, and it's uh, it's 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 actually one of the most beloved uh, programs of the medical students. Uh, uh, it loses money hand over fist, and we've gotten some philanthropic funds to support that. But uh, it's really quite a different experience uh, meeting someone, you know, on their own turf. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know where they can throw you out, and it, that's happened on occasion. But uh, you know, um, it's it's remarkable going to someone's home, seeing the photographs of them as a younger person, and and uh, you know, looking to see. Peek, I, I get nosy and look in the fridge to make sure food isn't spoiled, and. And uh, to you know, look in the medicine cabinet to make sure that medicines haven't expired. So the house call is making a comeback, um, and largely now driven by this movement towards accountable care organizations, where uh, uh, you as a physician or a health system will be penalized if you have to come to the emergency room for primary care. So stay, stay tuned. We care for about 100 or 150 people now. Uh, there's a little bit of a waiting list, but it's. Um, it's really, um, it's a wonderful kind of uh, program that harkens back to an era when I remember the doctor coming to see us at home and it really, um, really is quite lovely. So uh, you, uh, yes, there, there's, uh, there's one at Mount Sinai. Most of the major medical pro programs, uh, medical schools have such a program, uh, often um, housed within geriatrics just because of the, na the nature of our work. Yeah. Great. And even though I said it was the last question, I'll just, it was one of the cards, but I think it's just an important point that I missed over. So we're talking about we're talking about wellness and mental health wellness and physical wellness and things that you can do and there was a nutritionist in the audience who pointed out how valuable good nutritional counseling and the right kind of diet can be to people um, for all kinds of health reasons. So whoever wrote that one, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And in our experience doctors know many things. They don't really know nutrition. Right. Um, so that's, uh, and that is a critical issue. And in fact, one of the imp really important values of senior centers, because so many, even, oh, guess we have to rename them too. Um, <laughs> elder centers, gifted elder centers. Um, that's how we can get my grandmother there and your client there. That it's so important to have quality sites, not just for socialization and programming, but so that people can get good, healthy food. Because so often, if you're living alone, if you're not feeling as strong as you're used to, if you're suffering from loneliness and isolation and depression, are you really going to make sure you get those balanced meals every day? No, you're not. And yet not getting those balanced meals is almost a guarantee we're going to walk into many more of the problems all of you were talking about and presenting tonight. So I found this evening so educational. I want to thank the three of you for your phenomenal work that you do every day and for sharing with us. And I am really so glad so many people came out to hear. And I just again want to give a pitch that there's never enough services. There are never enough of the right options. But we are incredibly lucky here on the east side of Manhattan to have phenomenal programs from phenomenal healthcare institutions, um, social service organizations, and that please, please, if you know people who need help, maybe you won't get the right answer the first try. Keep going in search of the right answers for yourselves, for your loved ones, because we do have incredible options available to us, even if not enough. Um, so I do, I thank every professional who came here tonight and want to make sure um, that you just know that there's information in the back you can find out. You can ask for a senior resource guide. Maybe we need to change the name of that, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Print up new copies, um, where we're doing a new one now which provides information on almost every topic we can find about with services um, in the area on behalf of seniors. And in the fall, I'll have my annual senior resource fair. And there's all kinds of not-for-profits and government and healthcare groups who come to that. So please come to that if you don't know about that one. It's the Uber or senior resource fair for the city. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you.